Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, throughout the day today, we've seen some pretty strong winds that have shown up across parts of the United States and the Canadian Prairie. And if we start in the southeast, this is an area where it's been calm, big area of high pressure sitting here. But around that, these strong winds out of the southwest have come out of the central plains over through the eastern Corn Belt here. And in fact, some of these winds help to fan the flames of a field fire in Illinois. And it's just something to be thinking about this time of year as harvest goes on, that we're going to run the risk on these windy, dry days in, in fall of having those field fires. And this one was near a town called Monticello. You can find the front right in through here, but look back into the northwest. We've got strong winds coming out of parts of California and Oregon, as well as parts of Idaho at Montana getting into the southern Canadian prairie, and that's prompted red flag warnings. Elsewhere, there is an upper level low we're going to pay attention to right here. We'll talk about Sam in just a few moments. Got good news about Sam. But if I take you over here to the Pacific, I want to bring up a couple of things here. One of the big questions we're going to be asking and trying to answer is how much longer are we going to continue to see these deep troughs that keep forming here in and around Alaska, in this part of the Arctic, and then coming into the Gulf of Alaska, which send their storm systems over here toward British Columbia? How long does the high pressure ridge stay out here north of Hawaii rather than butting up against the west coast? And we do have this typhoon to be looking at here. Do we need to be considering the eventual path of these typhoons over the Pacific and where they could possibly go here in the month of October getting pulled into the North Pacific jet stream? All of those questions are valid to be asked right now. And to be honest with you, I could just keep going because one of the major discussions we're going to have at the end of this is what's going on with the MJO, which is right now sitting in this area, possibly moving over into the West Pacific. So let's get to all of that, but we're going to start here with some satellite imagery. Now throughout the day today, if I just kind of rewind the clock to this morning and play throughout the day, one of the big features is going to be this cutoff low that you see right here. It's trying to get pulled to the north, getting kind of yanked back into the main jet stream flow, which is actually what's producing the big coastal low here in the Pacific Northwest. And as it does so, the two features are going to start to draw quite a bit of moisture into the plains, increasing the rainfall chances there. We're going to answer that question of how long the harvest windows stay open in this area, because remember, this is an area that was extremely wet. In fact, it wasn't just the eastern Corn Belt. It stretched all the way into the southeast and eventually into the northeast, where we had the very, very heavy rainfall, including Ontario. How long do they continue to get the break to dry out to get harvest effort done? And look at the forest fire smoke that we still see down here in Southern California. Do conditions stay the way they are in California? Do we keep the high evaporation rates? I want to get to all of those things. But first, let's talk about the tropics. I'm going to go straight over to tropical storm, or excuse me, Hurricane Sam, major Hurricane Sam. It's got 120 mile an hour sustained winds right now, and it's expected to stay a major hurricane on its northward track. It's going to go to the east of Bermuda, and that's largely due to the position of these troughs that are going to be setting up here over the northeast. I'm going to explain to you what I'm talking about there in a few moments. But over the weekend, we did see the uh, naming of a tropical system, a subtropical system named Teresa, which took the letter T. And now the only two names left uh, in the alphabet are um, would, would go to Victor and Wanda, and those might be here because the National Hurricane Center is giving an 80% chance of development on this lead wave and an 80% chance on the second wave that follows it. If we did that, that would be the last two names on the list, even though we still have most of the second half of the hurricane season to go through, uh, and uh, we would be out of names from our traditional list, because remember, we don't use the letters Q, U, X, Y, and Z. Now, back to Sam. The latest updates on Sam are to keep the center of circulation out over the North Atlantic. There are some scenarios where we pull this back into the Canadian Maritimes, and I'm going to show you that in just a few moments. But most likely, this stays here in the North Atlantic. We'll come back to that in just a few moments. From here, though, I want to talk about what we've seen take place from the end of summer through the beginning of fall, and we're going to do that by assessing the jet stream level pattern. Uh, so from the pattern break that happened about, what, 40 days ago, back on the 15th of August, put us into a configuration where in this side of the Arctic or over Alaska and now down here into the Gulf of Alaska, we've seen repeated troughs that have developed. Now, we didn't have that all summer. In fact, all summer there was a massive ridge in this area. So this was the pattern shift. Now, with a low to the north and high pressure to the south, 
the flow around it kind of does something like this. And that's given us a very strong high momentum west to east facing jet stream that's really come in here into the Pacific Northwest and, and targeted it. And it changed the precipitation pattern for the Northern Plains. In fact, it changed it for much of the United States. Now, that was again from August 15th to just a couple of days ago. This is how the month to date pattern has looked. A deeper trough in the Gulf of Alaska, running up over a ridge that's been over California. So we've left California out of this flow pattern. But the question is, are we going to continue to see these deep troughs that are coming through the uh, Gulf of Alaska into British Columbia? Because I think that this pattern has been set for a bit too long. And there are things that are starting to shift finally that are going to give us a different look after we get past probably the first 10 days or more of October. So I'm talking about mid-October here in a few moments. Because the month-to-date precipitation ranks by climate district as a result of that pattern have given us a really strong rain shadow effect on the northern Rockies, keeping it very dry here in Montana, although we do have some better chances of moisture getting in there very soon. Uh, it's been very, very dry in and around Oklahoma and Texas. In fact, this climate reporting district having the driest uh, to this point in September, the driest to this point in September on record. We've also been dry in parts of the Western Corn Belt, while this whole sector here has been very wet. And I kind of singled out that spot right there in North Carolina, which keeps missing out on but very wet conditions here. Now, with that as kind of our view, I just want to take a look back over the last 14 days. So we can see where harvest efforts have really been made. So Nebraska, parts of Iowa, maybe Wisconsin and Minnesota, northern Illinois. But we've had some very wet weather in the eastern Corn Belt that slowed things down uh, considerably. So just keep this map in the back of your mind as we go forward. Because now that we've seen the month to date, the last two weeks, let's at least see what this has done to our surface, or at least our top 16 inch soil moisture value. So that's 40 centimeters. We've got some pretty dry soils in this part of the Corn Belt and in the Southern Plains. And we're gonna make some big changes to this, I think coming up very soon. Not in the way of flooding rains that shut everything down, but moisture's returning to these areas, which will chase us out of the fields. The question is, where's that coming from? And part of that answer is gonna start right here. We still have, take a look, there's one, two, three big troughs. I mean, you can kind of see them there. And another cutoff low in place right here. And the high pressure cell is still out there, which gives us a strong jet stream pattern that's doing this. And what I'm suggesting is we are still gonna continue to see these troughs coming through here through the next probably 10 to 15 days. But that might be the limit of it, meaning that the second half of October might look different and poss very strongly possibility that it will look different than the front half. So given all of that, let's go look at what this is doing. And I want to do a multi-model comparison for us here. So on the left, I have the GFS and on the right, I have the European and these are troughs and ridges. A couple things to point out. There's that deep trough over the uh, Pacific Northwest and that's Sam. Here's the cutoff here and here. All right. As we play this forward, what we're going to see here is that trough moves into the northwest. Both models have it through the beginning of this week, and that's why we see unsettled weather there through the next couple of days. But then we see that there's a bit of a reset happening in the North Pacific. Do you notice it? We get out here, uh, this is Friday, and there's still a weak trough here, but the next deep one is still way back here, and it's in both models. Now take a look at the other side of, of North America, though. The last week we were trying to figure out where this was going to be. That's where the GFS has it. This is where the European model has it. And that is Sam. Now look at the difference in the position here. Now why I'm really talking so much about this is because as we go through the weekend, the GFS grabs Sam, flings it around the north edge like this, whereas the European keeps the two things more separate. See it here? and sends it farther out to open ocean. Now, if you're watching this, look on the left-hand side first. Do you see how the GFS grabs Sam and tosses it into the Canadian Maritimes, whereas the European on the right does not? Meanwhile, while all of this is going on, there's a monstrous ridge setting up here. But to the south of it, the GFS is more aggressive right now with the development of low pressure here early next, well, the end of this weekend into early next week. And I want you to see what that does to the precipitation pattern. So let's distill all this down first by just having a look at total accumulated precipitation from one model, the European. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add up with time 
from the 12Z run how the precipitation is moving in. Why don't we stop at 7 a.m. on Thursday? At this point, if you're in this area of the Corn Belt, there is wide open harvest. Into the southeast, it's drier. We just had light rain moving through the northeast, and it's really the northward movement of that upper level low that really starts to draw in the better chances of rainfall here. But if you just go back through Wednesday, it's not until really Thursday, Wednesday night to Thursday, that we start to see this. Now it's after that that the rain continues to fill in. So I'll stop you again, how about 1 p.m. on Saturday? Again, through that time period, this area is dominated by higher pressure and it stays drier while we pull in more moisture into the central plains. And as we work our way into the weekend, it's not until we get out there until Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, that much of the Eastern Corn Belt begins to fill back in with precipitation and it moves out of the central plains. So let's just go all the way out there to day 10 and just stop it and take a look from the 12Z model run. It might be easier to look at the same data by showing you this map. It's the probability through the next 10 days of grabbing an inch of rainfall. And that's quite a bit of moisture returning to what was a very dry location. Remember me showing that at the beginning. And this is coming right here through our hard red winter wheat belt in the beginning of October. Well, the end of September, beginning of October. But a couple of areas that are gonna stay drier and the southeast. So just take note of that as we look at this near-term forecast. From here, I wanna do the same thing, but now I wanna look at the actual model output for the surface weather, because these models have different scenarios here. Playing through Tuesday, getting into Wednesday morning, afternoon and evening. Now you do notice that they both begin to draw that moisture in here by Wednesday evening. See it, the storms start to show up. We do have the next low that comes into British Columbia introducing some precip really in and around the Cascade Mountains, but primarily focused on Washington. As we then go through Wednesday night into Thursday morning, both models again are keeping this area for more active showers and storms. They're gonna be widely scattered, but we're gonna keep an eye out on it. And this gets into Friday, and let's just stop it right about here Friday evening. Now, you do see some differences at this point, okay? First of all, this is where SAM is in the GFS, and this is where SAM is in the European. You can already see those differences. We do see that both models are attempting to keep more of the storms in the south and mid-south, pulling them finally here into parts of the Western Corn Belt. It doesn't show up quite as well in the GFS. But keeping on through Saturday, Notice that the GFS is much more aggressive returning to the central and eastern Corn Belt than the European. Why? The European keeps a bigger area of high pressure here and does not develop a deeper trough over this area. The GFS does. And just playing this on forward, look at what happened to SAM. Remember, SAM gets pulled around the deeper trough over the east coast in the GFS and the European leaves it out here. So if I, if I lived right here, I'd be watching this GFS forecast run very carefully. But this is by the time we get to overnight hours on Saturday night into Sunday morning. And the differences are really felt in this part of the Eastern Corn Belt over to parts of the Appalachian Mountains, where the GFS is much more aggressive with low pressure development and the European isn't having any of it. So already by this weekend, we see some model differences. Playing into early next week, we continue to see those differences play out through Monday and Tuesday. So let's take that now and put it into a few maps. Let's look at three different maps. First. This is the European model, total accumulated precipitation through the next seven days. And this is the GFS, European GFS. Feel free to pause and take a look at both. Now, to compare the two, I wanna show you this. Notice how more precipitation, which is shown in these colors for the European model, is seen in the Central Plains. The GFS is wetter in Texas, and in the central and eastern Corn Belt and parts of the Mid-South, getting over here to Tennessee, Kentucky. This is where the GFS is wetter. Two very distinct differences. The GFS yanks SAM right in through here. The European leaves it out. And that's a primary, that's the primary analysis of the difference between the two models moving forward, at least for the lower 48. So take a quick look here. Because by the time we get out to day 10, both models at least want to have the pattern look like this. There's that trough again. So the flow is doing something like that with broad ridging over the Great, or excuse me, over the Hudson Bay. Now notice this: from day 10 on October 7th through the 8th, 9th, 10th, 
and 11th. What do we continue to see? Broader troughing in here, ridging in this area. That is the exact opposite of what we saw at the beginning of October a year ago. But I don't think October is going to be the same way for the whole month. In fact, I think October is going to be a, a tale of two halves. And I'd like to make a case for why I think that's going to be the situation. In the near term, though, if we keep bringing in troughs into the West, it would stand to reason that this is what our week two precipitation pattern looks like. They move through and eject. We return near normal precipitation in through here. We're still drier in the Southeast and increased rainfall coming out of parts of Texas and the four corner states. I believe the model is too dry in the Pacific Northwest as well. I think it's gonna be much closer to average there. So before we get to that analysis for October, let's quickly do temperatures. This is what the month to date temperature pattern has looked like. California, much of the Southwest and the four corner states, very warm. We've been cooler than average over the Southeast. But a lot of folks in the midsection of the country here have seen um, a pretty um, normal progression into early fall, if anything, slightly warmer than normal. We have had a few frosts. We had one over the weekend here right on the border between North and South Dakota. Where's our frost threat now? Well, it's right over here in this part of the Snake River Valley and in this part of Oregon and right here in California. All this other shading here is red flag warning. So let's go take a look at what those temperatures are going to do. We've already seen these high temperatures today, but watch this. The trough comes into the west by tomorrow, drops those temperatures in the Pacific Northwest way down, while out ahead of it, we're still into the 90s in the Dakotas. But there's gonna be a bit of temperature whiplash here because going from Tuesday into Wednesday and Thursday, we dropped those temperatures off from the 90s back into the 70s with overnight lows in the 40s and 50s. So here comes the cooler weather by Thursday into the midsection of the country. But then notice we go right back up again to the warmth across the northern tier of the United States as you saw that broader ridge taking shape by the end of the weekend. Now day 5 through 10, if we just stitch that all together, we get this temperature pattern. The warmer conditions move east and they stay in the Canadian prairie. We do have some cooler weather in the high plains overall during day 5 through day 10. And out there day 10 through 15, you do start to see the trough development here with the broader ridging, but these temperatures are not nearly as warm as earlier runs had had them. And that's why I'm thinking there's a pattern shift in the making for the middle of the month. And I want to explain to you now why I've been thinking that. It starts with the MJO. For like 45 days, the MJO has been preferring phases two and three, which are over the Indian Ocean, or it's been north of Australia here in phase four. We are finally getting evidence that the MJO is going to start to move. And if it does move over the next 15 days, weekly into phase five and six, but shows up in the Pacific Ocean, that is a major deviation we haven't seen since we went back to the middle of August. That's why I started today's video talking about the middle of August. We're returning to a different pattern. Now what often occurs when the MJO gets over here and we have a La Nina going, which we do, remember, our La Nina continues to strengthen in this area. It's doing so slowly, but it's there. Well, we tend to get this kind of jet stream pattern. Now what is it? This is when the MJO gets over into phase seven and we have a La Nina. Historically, that reintroduces ridging off of the Pacific Northwest. See that? And troughing, which means cooler air coming in through here. And I do think that by mid-month, this is a possibility. It's a possibility. And I'm going to be watching it carefully. So the only other piece to add to this is uh, when and what are the models saying? Well, my win for this is not until after about October 10th through the 15th. I think it's going to be after that. But the models, if we take a look at what they're suggesting, are doing something like this. Let's look at precipitation first, and I'm going to show you the whole of um, uh, October here. Now, much of what we got coming in here with wetter than average conditions, this is not the massive flooding rains that shut down harvest. That's not what we're talking about here. What this is suggesting is we're moving that moisture out of the plains into the western corn belt uh, in the next few days, and the models are carrying it forward. But take a look at what happens when I just let this play out to the very end. This now goes from mid-October to mid-November. Now we see the moisture returning to the northwest. We see near normal to above normal precip in the Corn Belt and wetter conditions here. I don't think the models have caught up yet with the full transition. And on the temperature side of this, let's look at a 30-day sliding window. Let's come back here. This is October. Do you see the model cooling things down as we move forward? 
that would be what I would expect if we somehow work our way toward this pattern by the end of the month. So I'm gonna watch out for it. And we're gonna see if La Nina dominates or if the La Nina plus the transition in the MJO take over. And I think that's what's gonna give you this clue for this mid-month pattern break. And by the way, that would be a two-month break. And what's interesting is, and there's don't read any more into this one, I'm gonna tell you. The pattern break we saw from June 15 to August 15, that was two months. And then from August 15 now to possibly October 15, that would be another two months. Now again, weather doesn't behave in two month cycles, but it's just something I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious about for this particular uh, cycle that we're in, all right? So thank you so much for watching. We'll talk to you again on Thursday.